who is an underrated woman from history who needs more exposure. Nellie Bly is my personal favorite. She was a journalist in the 1890s who was given an assignment to investigate the woman's lunatic asylum on Blackwell's Island due to accusations of the mistreatment of patients. She got in there by faking insanity and getting herself committed to the asylum and when she was finally released, she ran an expose in the New York World called 10 Days, in a madhouse that exposed the awful treatment of patients inside the asylum. This was considered a revolution in investigative journalism, plus she read, around the world, in 80 days basically decided she could do better and went around the world in 72 days. She was also an inventor and was one of the primary journalists to cover the suffragette movement. One of my favorite historical figures who doesn't get enough attention. Irena Sendler 1910-2008, she saved 2,500 children during the Holocaust from the Warsaw Ghetto, even when she was arrested and tortured, she wouldn't reveal the identities of those children or the people she was working with, later, after her escape, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Mala Zimitbaum was a Jewish-Polish-slash-Belgian woman who got deported to Auschwitz in September 1942. She was fluent in multiple languages like Polish, German, French, Dutch and English so the SS assigned to administrative duties within the camps and she worked as an interpreter-slash-massager for the Nazis. This work allowed her to get a slightly better treatment as in more food-slash-decent clothing and not-so-nightmarish living condition in the camps. The SS trusted her and needed her so they let her survive there for two years, many survivors talk about how she always tried TP help as much as she could and never used her privileges against people, she snuck food slash letters in the camps, would falsify the list of people sent to the gas chambers in order to save as many lives as possible and tried to save women from very harsh work in order to save their lives, in 1944 with her lover, another inmate who worked occasionally in the women camp, she managed to escape Auschwitz for about two weeks before getting caught by the Nazis. She was very close to the Slovakian border and almost escaped. She got brought back to the camp, got tortured for weeks and sentenced to public hanging. All Jewish women had to see her execution. Before her hanging the Nazi commander started a siege about how escaping is useless and while giving his speech, Mala took a razor blade from her hair and opened her veins to commit suicide. The commander grabbed her arm and she slapped him in the face. Her last words differs from versions to version, but she apparently screamed, I'll die a hero while you'll die like a pig before the Nazis started beating her up and ordered the prisoners to bring her alive to the crematorium. She is mentioned in almost all women survivor testimonies of Auschwitz. Edit, I'll add what makes her story feel more badass is that Mala would have probably survived the war if she didn't escape. Her work duties made it so that SS trusted her and according to survivors, have some sort of respect for her. Now the last few months of the who cost are a clusterfuck, and maybe she would have died, but Imo she had a pretty good shot at making it to the end of the war if she stayed in the camp. She escaped Auschwitz with apparently documents testifying of the extermination process going on there. She didn't solely escape because she wanted to be free, she escaped because she wanted the world to know what was going on. Grace Hopper, she invented the compiler which is the tool computer programmers used to turn their code into software. She was told computers were for doing calculations and not for running programs, so it couldn't be done. She figured it out anyway and changed the world forever. She might be the most important woman of all time, nobody knows who she is. Marioti Oberskaya, after her husband was killed by Germans during WWII she bought herself a tank, asked Stalin permission to go to the front lines, and on her first maneuver killed 30 Nazis. She wrote to her sister, I've had my baptism by fire, I beat the bastards, sometimes I'm so angry, I can't even breathe. Bessie Coleman, saved up money from being a manicurist and chili slinger tried to go to aviation school, was denied for being female and black, and eventually was financially back to travel to France to earn her aviator's license, which she did in 1921. She came back to the US as the first woman of black and Native American descent to earn an aviation license and the first person of black and not descent to earn an international aviation license. To make a living as a civilian aviator, she became a barnstormer and exhibition aviator. She died five years later when the plane she was flying went into a spin, and she was thrown out at 2000 FD. Fathima bint Muhammad al Al-Qurashi, a few, long name, founder of the oldest still-running university, 
After her dad and her husband ate dirt, instead of sitting around and basking in her enormous wealth, she decided to start the world's first degree-giving uni. It's been running since 800. Ch Margaret the Human Calculator Hamilton, she led the team assigned to develop code for Apollo 11's onboard flight software. She was so brilliant and so accurate that she was asked to check the math performed by MIT's asterisk computers. Asterisk, this, by itself, is remarkable. It gets better, of course. While preparing for the Apollo 11 flight, Hamilton urged her male superiors that the mission required additional backup code to act as a failsafe in case something went wrong. She was criticized and ordered to do no such thing because the astronauts were trained never to make a mistake. Defying orders, Hamilton programmed the code anyway, and wouldn't you know it, minutes before Apollo 11 landed on the surface of the moon, something did go wrong. An alarm was triggered and the moon landing was in peril. It was Hamilton's code that saved the mission. Without her, we likely would not have landed on the moon photo of Hamilton standing next to the listings of software she and her team created for the Apollo mission https slash slash upload wikimedia or wikipedia slash commons slash d slash db slash margaret underscore Hamilton underscore underscore restoration jpg edit for those claiming my information is incorrect or that the story is fictional here are my sources https slash www google com amp slash s slash www news com 2017 slash 12 slash 04 slash margaret hamilton slash amp slash https slash www smithsonian mag com smithsonian institution slash margaret hamilton led nasa software team landed astronauts moon 180 97 15 75 slash https slash slash and m wikipedia org wiki slash margaret underscore hamilton underscore software underscore engineer Julie Dobigny had a fascinating life. She was a duelist and opera singer in the late 1600s that dressed as a man but didn't try to hide her gender. She got in many duels with men over insults or other matters and became lovers and friends with a young noble she beat in a duel. One time, when her girlfriend's parents decided they didn't want their daughter hanging around Julie anymore, they sent her to live in a convent. So of course Julie decided to break in, fake her girlfriend's death, and run off together into the night. Her life reads more like an action slash drama film than a biography. Chick was badass. Irena Sendler. She smuggled dozens of babies out of the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw, Poland. She would write down their names and keep them in a jar, then using her job as a social worker would make them fake papers and place the children in orphanages, willing Polish families, convents, and just about anywhere else where they would be safe. She was eventually caught by the Gestapo and withstood torture to keep the names and locations of those children safe and was sentenced to death but luckily managed to escape thanks to some last-minute bribery. During the end of the war, she worked as a nurse under a different name and was even shot at one point by a German deserter looking for food. When the war ended she became the head of the Department of Social Welfare in Warsaw and set about trying to reunite all the children she had saved with their parents most of which had been sadly executed in the Treblinka concentration camp and those which she couldn't get united with their parents she smuggled to Israel so they could at least be safe out of Poland. After that she continued to have a few high state positions as well as be deputy director of two medical schools in Warsaw. She died in 2008. Cleopatra often gets shafted by history, portrayed as a simple femme fatale for the great men of Rome. In truth, Cleopatra was incredibly smart, able to speak nine languages, was the first member of her dynasty to even bother learning Egyptian, and she ruled effectively for 11 years before Augustus annexed Egypt. She was one of the smartest women of her day, and should be appreciated more than as a simple fuck buddy of Caesar and Antony. Motherfucking Ida B. Wells. This badass bitch pulled a Rosa Parks 71 years earlier by refusing to move to another train car when they ordered her to. When black people were getting lynched, she called out those racist cowards with her journalism saying truth like, Nobody in this section of the community believes that old threadbare lie that Negro men rape white women. If Southern men are not careful, a conclusion might be reached which will be very damaging to the moral reputation of their women. When women were trying to get the vote, they tried to tell her to march at the back, but you can take a guess on whether or not she listened to them. Edith Wharton, she may finally be getting her due as entering the canon a great American writer, but most people don't know about how she led her life. She was born Edith Jones, and to an old New York family so rich and established they are literally the ones referred to in keeping up with the Jones. 
Her life was obviously not one of financial poverty, but emotional. Her mother decided she was too ugly to make a good match, so they married her off to a much older man who was, literally, insane. He was unstable and abusive and she did something almost totally unheard of in her circles. She got a divorce, this expelled her from polite society and what little sympathy she might have had from her old connections was lost when she did something just as unacceptable she decided to have a profession as a writer. Eventually, she could not bear the shunning of the us and became an expat living in Paris where she felt she could start again. During her lifetime, she was never considered to be a writer of equal intellectual status to her male contemporaries, such as Henry James. However, she had some success financially, and otherwise she won a Pulitzer, and she lived as a single woman by her own rules at a time when that was rarely done. Her revenge, of course, was that she wrote very popular books portraying this New York society as full of toxic, destructive hypocrites who are generally just parasites on the rest of humanity. To this day, people still eat this stuff up reading books about how the rich are totally miserable ish holes and just end up ruining each other's lives because no one is happy and no one can be happy her life wasn't perfect she never found a real love match which was a big source of sadness for her apparently she just felt like she had too much baggage as a woman too ugly a professional divorced she did share a lover with henry james morton fullerton it seems according to letters she was really quite devoted to him or wanted to be but the feelings weren't entirely mutual. Wharton's big lucky break in life was that she had a father who loved her, and he valued her intellect and allowed her to, rather secretly, educate herself in his library and develop her mind in ways that were unacceptable for women at the time. I think she was a badass. It's a shame that Amy Noether hasn't been mentioned yet. Noether's theorem is one of the most important and fundamentally beautiful results from the 20th century in math slash theoretical physics, and that's just one of the many impressive things she accomplished, yet seemingly nobody outside of those who studied those fields in college has heard of her. Sophie Schall, she was a member slash co-founder of the White Rose who were a resistance group against the Nazis. She and her brother were students who risked their lives distributing pamphlets in University of Munich explicitly condemning Nazi policy and the Nazis in general. They were caught, she was told she would be spared the death penalty if she denounced her anti-Nazi beliefs. She did not, her and her brother along with other members of White Rose were executed in 1943. There is a great film about Sophie Schall and White Rose called Sophie Schall, The Final Days, which I highly recommend. The full thing is on YouTube as well. The Wasps, they were a group of women who flew aircrafts for the US during WWII. Their duties were always aviation based, but they did pretty much anything in that field that the military wanted at any time. They were all well-trained pilots but were still not allowed to be considered part of the military when it came to benefits. This meant that they got hand-me-down uniforms from male personnel and weren't treated with the same respect. Even better yet, and had to learn to fly one or two specific aircrafts. While these women learned how to fly almost all the different types at the time, and everyone had different instrument panels and such, and only in 1977 did the women who served get considered veterans and got veteran honors, I highly recommend reading about them. Lies Meitner HTTPS slash slash and Wikipedia or wiki slash lies back slash underscore Meitner and justly denied the Nobel Prize which was awarded solely to her colleague Otto Hahn for discovering nuclear fission. Ryu Kwansen, a Korean resistance leader during the Japanese occupation, her parents were killed by Japanese soldiers at a protest. She organized protests and carried a smuggled copy of the Declaration of Independence. She refused to give up the names of her collaborators, even though she'd been tortured horribly. She died in a pit at the age of 17. She needs a biographical movie as soon as possible. HTTPS slash www.unitimes.com 2018 slash 03 slash 28 slash obituaries slash overlooked you once on HTML. Hildegard of Bingen, I first heard of her in my music class, but music was only one of her many contributions, she definitely deserves to be more appreciated. Mary Anning, she was pretty much the first female paleontologist and revolutionized the field, she worked on the cliffs at Lyme Rigus and one of her most famous finds was a basically complete ichthyosaurus fossil, when snooty rich men came to buy the fossils they found they refused to believe that she was the one who did the work because no peasant girl could have possibly been so educated on such a topic. We had a character day in year 3 when we had to dress up as our favorite person from a book, and I went as her. 
Larry Wollstonecraft, philosopher, advocate for women's rights in the 1700s, and the mother of Mary Shelley, Aka, the author of Frankenstein, one of the most iconic characters and books of all time. All the UK women who took over their husbands' farms during WWII, their duties were literally endless. Not only did they oversee or personally plow the soil for years until it was entirely depleted and unusable, they also communicated enemy plane locations as they passed overhead of their land at great personal risk. They also lit the coy fires and blacked out their homes to mask their true location from German planes, took refugees into their properties, and lived on rations they had to split with those refugees, all on top of dealing with government officials whose sole purpose was to make sure the farm was putting out the utmost amount of crops, or their duties and land would be seized and given to someone else to be worked harder. If not for these women, the whole country would have starved, as Hitler would not allow any shipments at all into their harbors, including food and informed it with submarine firepower. Grace O'Malley, also known as Grainy M-H-A-I-L-L-E, she was an Irish pirate, ruler and all-round badass, especially cool as when Queen Elizabeth I offered her a handkerchief, which Grain used and then threw into the fire. I only heard about her recently and she seems amazing in every way. P.D. Lamar, movie star genius who created a code of different radio frequencies that the Nazis could decipher. Afra Ben, first female to make a living as a writer in England, worked as a spy for the government and they fucked her over when they didn't pay her, husband died at sea and she had to chuck him overboard, she's fascinating, worth a google for sure. In World War II, there was a group of Russian lady bombers called the Night Witches who would the shit out of German lines. The thing is, is that they had the noisiest and shittiest planes in the world, like, the engines would shut off midair, so they would have to climb out onto the wings to restart them. The planes were also so noisy that in order for the Germans to not hear them, they would climb up to a certain height, coast down, drop their bombs, restart their engines midair and get the fuck out before they got hit. Their leader flew over 200 missions and was never captured. The Nazi Nazis called them night witches because you couldn't hear them. They basically appeared out of the night as if they were flying on brooms and dropping bombs. By 1943, asterisk asterisk Nancy, wake, asterisk asterisk was the Gestapo's most wanted person with a 5 million franc price on her head, asterisk, wake described her tactics, a little powder and a little drink on the way, and I'd pass their German posts and wink and say, do you want to search me, god what a flirtatious little bastard I was. Asterisk, Wake was parachuted into the Auvern, becoming a liaison between London and the local Maquis group headed by Captain Henry Tardivat in the forest of Trunais. Upon discovering her tangled in a tree, Captain Tardivat greeted her remarking, I hope that all the trees in France bear such beautiful fruit this year, to which she replied, don't give me that French shit. Asterisk, at one point Wake discovered that her men were protecting a girl who was a German spy, they did not have the heart to kill her in cold blood, but when Wake insisted that she would perform the execution, they capitulated, asterisk, her French companions, especially Henry Tardivat, praised her fighting spirit, amply demonstrated when she killed an SS sentry with her bare hands to prevent him from raising the alarm during a raid, during a 1990s television interview, when asked what had happened to the sentry who spotted her, Wake Wake simply drew her finger across her throat, he killed a Nazi with a judo chop, asterisk, Wake rode a bicycle for more than 300 kilometers 190 me through several German checkpoints to get to another group's wireless operator and send a message to London apprising them of the situation, unfortunately she could not convince the operator that she was with the so, so she finally searched out the local Maquis who did send her message, Wake then had to ride the bike back to where she started and she did all this in 72 hours. Theodora, Justinian's wife and empress of the Byzantine Empire, from prostitute and actress to arguably the second most powerful person in the world at the time, she saved Justinian's ass and wasn't afraid to voice her own opinions. When Justinian succeeded to the throne in 527, two years after the marriage, Theodora became empress of the Eastern Roman Empire. She shared in his plans and political strategies, participated in state councils, and Justinian called her his partner in my deliberations 14. She had her own court, her own official entourage, and her own imperial seal 15. Theodora, 
proved herself a worthy and able leader during the Nika riots. There were two rival political factions in the empire, the Blues and the Greens, who started a riot in January 532 during a chariot race in the Hippodrome. The riots stemmed from many grievances, some of which had resulted from Justinian's and Theodora's own actions. 16. The rioters set many public buildings on fire and proclaimed a new emperor, Hypatius, the nephew of former emperor Anastasius I, unable to control the mob. Justinian and his officials prepared to flee. At a meeting of the government council, Theodora spoke out against leaving the palace and underlined the significance of someone who died as a ruler instead of living as an exile or in hiding, reportedly saying, Royal Purple is the noblest shroud 17. As the emperor and his counselors were still preparing their project, Theodora interrupted them and claimed, My lords, the present occasion is too serious to allow me to follow the convention that a woman should not speak in a man's council. Those whose interests are threatened by extreme danger should think only of the wisest course of action, not of conventions. In my opinion, flight is not the right course. Even if it should bring us to safety, it is impossible for a person, having been born into this world, not to die. But for one who has reigned, it is intolerable to be a fugitive. May I never be deprived of this purple robe, and may I never see the day when those who meet me do not call me Empress. If you wish to save yourself, my lord, there is no difficulty, we are rich, over there is the sea, and yonder are the ships, yet reflect for a moment whether, when you have once escaped to a place of security, you would not gladly exchange such safety for death. As for me, I agree with the adage that the royal purple is the noblest shroud 18. Her determined speech convinced them all, including Justinian himself, who had been preparing to run. As a result, Justinian ordered his loyal troops, led by the officers, Belisarius and Mundus, to attack the demonstrators in the Hippodrome, killing according to Procopius, over 30,000 rebels. Despite his claims that he was unwillingly named emperor by the mob, Hypatius was also put to death, apparently at Theodora's insistence. Nine interpretations that Justinian never forgot that it was Theodora who had saved his throne, depend on seeing Procopius' account as a straightforward report, and not framed to impugn Justinian with the implication that he was more cowardly than his wife. Theodora worked against her husband's support of Chalchonian Christianity in the ongoing struggle for the predominance of each faction 25. As a result, she was accused of fostering heresy and thus undermined the unity of Christendom. In spite of Justinian being Chalchonian, Theodora founded a Miaphysite monastery in Sikh and provided shelter in the palace for Miaphysite leaders who faced opposition from the majority of Chalchonian Christians, like Severus and Anthemus. Anthemus had been appointed Patriarch of Constantinople under her influence, and after the excommunication order he was hidden in Theodora's quarters for 12 years, until her death, when the Chalchonian Patriarchy from provoked a violent revolt in Antioch, eight Miaphysite bishops were invited to Constantinople and Theodora welcomed them and housed them in the Hormistas Palace adjoining the Great Palace, which had been Justinian and Theodora's own dwelling before they became Emperor and Empress. Her influence on Justinian was so strong that after her death he worked to bring harmony between the Monophysites and the Chalchonian Christians in the Empire, and he kept his promise to protect her little community of Monophysite refugees in the Hormisdas Palace. Theodora provided much political support for the ministry of Jacob Baradaeus, and apparently, personal friendship as well. Deal attributes the modern existence of Jacobite Christianity equally to Baradaeus and to Theodora 29. Rosalind Franklin for the discovery of structure of DNA James Watson and Francis Crick took and do credit for work of Franklin, which was critical to the discovery. Milanka Savic, she is Serbian Mulanay hero of WW1 and the first woman in history to be decorated for serving in combat. Edit, thanks for the gold. Sibyl Luddington, homegirl rode twice the distance of Paul Revere to warn nearby towns of the British attack. She was 16 years old. Two kettles, together, an Oneida woman who fought at the Battle of Oriskany, https slash slash and wikipedia org wiki slash tionionogen. Francis Kelsey, a doctor who prevented the US from selling a drug called thalidomide, pregnant women in Germany took it to ease morning sickness because they thought that it wouldn't affect their unborn child but after many tests conducted by Francis and a bunch of deformed children from the pregnant women who took thalidomide, Francis was able to convince the US from selling the drug, she is truly the best. 
Christine de Pizan. She was French courtier in the 14th and early 15th century. She was the daughter of a humanist who taught her how to read and write. After the death of her husband, she wrote to support herself and her children. Her writing was resolutely prolific. She wrote several books of poetry and ballads, but also of philosophy, politics and ethics. One of her most famous books, Asterisk Lacit de Dames, The City of Ladies, and Asterisk Le Livre de Trois Virtus, the Book of the Three Virtues, are, respectively, a book defending women's rights as equal and valuable members of society, and their right to education in particular, and a manual for the instruction and education of women of all classes. She is widely considered to be the first woman to have lived off of her writing in the French language. She was a badass feminist in the 1300s. She was a widely respected intellectual in an era where that was not something women were allowed to do. Honestly, it's a tragedy. She's not more well known. The WASPs Women Air Force Service Pilots of WWII, they were fully classified for 30 plus years after the war, didn't even get recognized for their service until 1977, didn't receive any citations for their work until 2009, and it wasn't until after that that they received the right to be buried with military honors. Michelle Mouton, legendary rally driver who Nikki Lauda called Superwoman, that's saying something when one of best drivers of all time who was no from his brutal honesty calls somebody Superwoman. Also another one is Susie Wolf who was first woman to take part of F1 weekend in 2014. Elizabeth Fry, she was a social reformer, often been referred to as the Angel of Prisons. She was a major driving force behind new legislation to make the treatment of prisoners more humane. Celia Payne, she was the one who figured out the composition of stars hydrogen fusing into helium, probably one of the most impactful observations in the universe. Her PhD advisor didn't think her discovery would be well received, so he talked her out of publishing it for a while. Eventually she became the first female professor at Harvard, also Annie Jump Cannon. She came up with the star classification system based on size and temperature that all astronomy uses today. These two observations are so fundamental, it's had to imagine what anyone thought before them. Susan Rogers, she was Prince's sound engineer at a time where there were literally no female engineers. HTTPS slash slash tapiopcom interviews slash 117 slash Susan Rogers slash I Pasha, the earliest female mathematician who we know much about, and also a philosopher and astronomer, murdered by a Christian mob in 415. Ada Lovelace, she was one of first people to see the potential of computing machines back in the mid-1800s and is regarded as one of the first programmers and first female coder. Neith Hotep, possibly the first woman in history whose name we know, a member of the first dynasty ruling Old Kingdom Egypt, she may have ruled the kingdom herself as a pharaoh or regent, amazingly, we're still learning more about her, there was a significant discovery about her just in 2016 previously, we had thought she was the wife of the first king, https slash slash and wikipedia org wiki slash Neith Hotep. Admiral Grace Hopper, one of the first computer scientists and a certified badass. Queen Mary of Romania, she was a British princess that became the queen of an unstable country. She helped it so much and was named, at one point, the only real man in the whole Romania. Nellie Bly, she was a badass investigative journalist who exposed corruption in Mexico and also exposed the abuse going on at the Blackwell Islands Asylum by going undercover as an insane woman and experiencing the abuse and talking to patients there some who weren't even mentally ill and then called her lawyer when they wouldn't believe she wasn't insane, then wrote an expose which helped get it shut down. She also traveled around the world in what I believe is 72 days and beat another journalist from a competing newspaper as well just to see if she could beat the 80 days in Jules Verne's book around the world in 80 days. HTTPS slash slash and Wikipedia org wiki slash Irena backslash underscore Sendler, Irena Sendler humanitarian, savior of children, tough woman, resistance member and a true hero, willing to be rather tortured by Nazis than to give up lives of others. Harriet Jacobs, American slave woman, when she was 15, she gave up her virginity to a neighboring plantation owner because her own owner kept dropping hints that he wanted her. She got two kids by this guy and was judged by even her own family because she did it willingly to avoid being raped. Once her owner made it clear that he was still intent on having her as his personal sex slave, Jacobs gave her kids to her grandmother and hid in a cellar to stay near her children. 
because she did not leave that cellar for backslash asterisk seven whole years backslash asterisk she was crippled for life. In the meantime, she fooled her master into thinking she was in Boston. Seven years later she actually went to Boston and got work as a maid while she worked on getting her kids out of the south since the dick she fathered them with showed no interest in freeing them. Slave hunters get onto her scent at this time, so the woman she was working for gives Harriet backslash her own baby backslash asterisk so Harriet could pose as a nurse going up to Canada. The narrative ends with Harriet's employer buying her her free papers, but later Harriet gets her kids up north and writes her book at night while working a full job as a nanny. Harriet Beecher Stowe later tries to steal her story and fails because Jacobs doesn't trust her. Woman could not catch a break. Josephine Baker was a popular entertainer in Europe and America and she lived in Paris when the Nazis invaded. Now, she was popular enough in Paris that the Nazis feared what kind of pushback they'd get if they did anything to her, despite the fact that she was a black woman, which were both things that the Nazis historically did not like very much, so one might forgive Baker for just shutting up and enjoying the relative comfort she had, but she did do that, no, she served as a spy for the Allies and the French resistance, smuggling information across France during tours. After the war, she became a civil rights icon, refusing to perform for segregated audiences and became such a powerful symbol that MLK's wife asked her to take up her husband's place in the movement after he was assassinated. There are at least three awesome movie scripts in that life story, and it is a crime that none of them have been made. That Chinese pirate lord is pretty badass, and I can't believe Hollywood hasn't made a badass woman movie about her yet. The fucking lioness of Brittany, Jean de Clisson, my favorite woman in all of history. She was a noble woman and her husband was executed on charges of treason and she was pissed. She sold off all his lands and estates, everything and used the money to buy three ships that she had painted black and used red sails. They became known as the Black Fleet and they struck fear and terror into the hearts of many Frenchmen as she massacred them. She would kill everyone but one or two dudes that she left alive just to tell the story and help spread the fear. She was basically the origin of a lot of pirate fiction. People were fucking terrified of her. She even put coastal towns and fortresses to the sword and torch. France fucked her, so she fucked France. She teamed up with the Brits to secure their supremacy over the English Channel and all that good stuff. She wasn't in it for profit, duty, or anything else. She was just there to fuck France in any way she possibly could. Her flagship that she captained herself was called My Revenge. Best part is, she fucked France until she was either 50 or 60 years old and her ship was finally sank, but she survived. But she figured she'd fuck them hard and long enough and was getting too old for this shit. So she retired and married an English noble and lived the rest of her days with him. Interestingly, Charles de Blois was the one who fingered her husband and accused him of treason. This asshole later became a Catholic saint. Those Catholics will make anyone a saint if they are popular enough, regardless of what they do. Henrietta Lacks, no one knows who she is but her cells are still being used in labs all over to this day, all without her consent or knowledge. Ada Lovelace, she published the first algorithm ever for computers and was in general a total badass, 